Good morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, just upon reflection, uh, <coughs> my mate, my, my close uh, friend in the Lord, Johnny Blake and I, probably 18 years ago, we, we had the key to the front door and um, we would come one in the morning, three in the morning, four in the afternoon and uh, we would just uh, lie on the altar and pray and um, I really believe that that was uh, a time of prayer that the Lord had um, led us to undertake. Uh, we, we, we 2005, we then, uh, the Lord led us to Mozambique for a period of time and, and, um, and, and the Holy Spirit really moved I in the place and signs and, and, and wonders followed. And uh, it, it, it was absolutely birthed in prayer. And I, I really believe that um, this church has been birthed in prayer and not only my brother and I. Um, so Scott Harrison's my name. I, I, I do coach rugby union, as Andrew mentioned. It's, you know, some things in life, you, 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 you submit your life to the Lord, but... but that area in my life I've kept and, and I was born in, into the game through my family. Um, my son played rugby union. He now lives in the States. My daughter plays premier grade women's rugby union. My wife manages and uh, I, I coach, assistant coach premier grade and we've just come back from a, uh, a boot camp uh, late last night, which I'll, I'll talk about briefly. Um, my testimony, and I, and I think it's really important. Um, you know, the Word of God tells us that we are to study the Word of God to show ourselves approved, but it's also for us to give each other testimony. And testimony is all about life experiences. Uh, I was 25, um, uh, 30, 35 years ago, and uh, by trade I'm a rigger. So I was a class one top hand rigger. And I put uh, cranes up all over Australia, high-rise cranes, I was the top hand. And we operated a, a what was called a 200-ton link belt crane. And that was uh, imported from the US, it was brand new. Um, and I, my mate was a Maori, big Maori gentleman used to drive the crane and I was the top hand. And, and it had 440 foot of boom or 440 foot of stick as they would say. So we worked um, at 40 storeys above the street level and we put up most of the high-rise buildings in in Sydney in the late 80s. I did shutdowns all over the country. We put up a, a couple of cranes um, on the new Parliament House in Canberra, 1984. But my crane driver, my mate, used to, in between lifts, pull out a little red book and, and I, I knew nothing about God. And I mean nothing about God. So we worked in an extremely dangerous occupation. We didn't have radios a lot of the time back then. It was all by whistle. Um, and between lifts, he would pull out his little red New Testament and read his New Testament. So over a period of time, uh, I started to ask him some questions about what he was doing. And, and he, never, he never came across heavy. It was all about, for me, it was all about testimony. It was his, his, the testimony that he showed me um, in his life. And so probably six months of, we would work big hours. So we'd work sun up to sundown seven days a week. But I'd often go home and ring him up and, and ask him a question. And he would always have, at that point in time, he would always have an answer for me out of his little red New Testament. To the point where one afternoon I came home and I, um, I gave my heart to the Lord over the phone with him. Um, and it was, <coughs> as we all know, it was, you know, these moments in our lives are a turning point. So that was, again, 35 years ago. But what happened for me was probably about three weeks later, I was on the roof of a very large uh, horse racing 
uh, precinct in Sydney and we were using the crane and we were transferring gear from outside to in. And I, in that time, had bought my own little Red New Testament. And in between a lift, I opened it up and it was like the Lord revealed himself to me off the page. It was a, a, a revelation from the word of God. Now, I can't answer for anybody else as far as their conversion is concerned. But for me, God revealed himself to me through his word. So for me, that's been the absolute bedrock for the next 35 years as far as my seeking God. It's been from his word and his word alone. But in that 35 years, be under no illusion that he's broken me and he's broken me and he's broken me. And any other walk is probably not a walk being led by the Holy Spirit because when we read the scriptures, it's about yielding and it's about yielding and it's about yielding so that his will be done because I've got a very powerful will. So I'm forever grateful for that and I'm forever grateful for my uh, association with my brother, Johnny Blake, who is, I think he just finished preaching in Columbia and I think he's heading to Thailand to preach now and he'll be home shortly. My foundation scripture this morning for me is a really important scripture and it's Hebrews 11.11 11, and I'll read it out. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered up of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. thought about what I was going to preach today and I said to Dennis, I, I would really like to springboard so that, you know, we, we're not bringing anything new in, but springboard from where you left off and that was for, uh, for me two weeks ago because we weren't here last, last um, Sunday. And Dennis's message was all about um, uh, Jesus being our friend or we being friends of Jesus. And I'll read it again, John 15, 13 to 14. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So my heart, and it's probably the same I heart I have with coaching young men in rugby union, is about edifying and encouraging and bringing people to action. Because we see in the book of Acts, the first verse says, and Jesus both began, began to do both, to teach and to do. Jesus began to both teach and to do. So for me, everything Jesus did was strategic. It had an absolute purpose. Everything he said was strategic and it had an absolute purpose. So for me, I'm not a scholar. Uh, I don't study the word in Greek or Hebrew, you know, other men and women are called to do that by God. For me, I like to galvanize your, um, the hearer's faith or, or, or come underneath you and, 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 and galvanize you based on my own life experiences. And that word galvanize means, we know about galvanize steel, but that word galvanize means bring to action. So to charge to action. So as believers, or if we want to believe and pray the Lord's Prayer that His we will be done in our life, that life is a life of action. It's a life of believing and it's a life of action based on us being led by the Holy Spirit. And Solomon taught us, diligence is man's most precious possession. Not IQ, not princely status, but diligence. Diligence where you create a habit or an incremental habit that then turns into something so much bigger than you. So it starts to steamroll and it starts to create something that you can't stop, whether it's a good habit or a bad habit. But I'm now talking about good habits. 
I've got here, the book of Acts finishes abruptly. However, Jesus taught us that he must go to the Father and that he would send us another, his Holy Spirit, so that Jesus could reign on the throne of our hearts, transforming that which was weak and helpless. That's the continuation of the book of Acts. So we saw here two weeks ago a young girl that with her mum came up with her mum for prayer. And we all prayed for her. That's the Pentecostal church, as Jane said. And what we saw was just another act post the book of Acts. And all these acts will be recorded in heaven. They are recorded in heaven. So that's what we're charged to do. You know, when we read Corinthians, we read about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We also read about the fruit that is just, if not more important. But Jesus went to the Father to send us the Holy Spirit. And sometimes, as I've learned recently, the Holy Spirit is sometimes misunderstood in the church. Because the Holy Spirit has been given to us the power's already been given to us. We're not to ask for the power. We have been given the power. And if we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit is going to reveal Jesus to our hearts. And Jesus is going to be enthroned on our hearts. And that is God's most perfect will for us. Let's now venture on a line that I really believe would please the Lord this morning. And for me... It is all about pleasing the Lord. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith working by love, that is. Mark 11, 2 to 6. Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as you be entered into it, you, sh you shall find a colt tied, wherein never man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do you this? Say you that the Lord has need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways meet. And they loosed him, and certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do you loosing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus, even as Jesus commanded, and they let them go. See, I believe the primary purpose of that passage of Scripture, the primary purpose of that event, was an instruction to the disciples to learn that whatever Jesus said must come to pass. So they, they had absolutely no idea that that cult was going to be tied up and that cult was going to be available to bring back to Jesus. So we read the Gospels and we read the challenges that the disciples first had when they first followed Christ because they had to go through the same process that we had to go through. They had to renew their minds and they had to renew their hearts. So that passage, that act, that act there, when you really dig deep into it, that was one of the most strategic things that Jesus could have done to convince the disciples that whatever he speaks will come to pass. That whatever the written word is, that's a promise. That's a guarantee to the hearer. And that was, an, for me, a turning point in the disciples' lives where they would have started to conceive in their heart what Jesus had spoken to them. Not just in the mind, but starting to conceive in the heart what Jesus had spoken to them. Come back to rugby union. And, and I, I, I only say this because, again, this is about my own life experiences and my wife's life experiences. So we've just come back from a pre-season camp. Uh, our team won the premiership, the premier... Uh, premiership last year and, and and so we're now the hunted so so uh, to win back-to-back -back premierships at that level 
is really, really difficult. So, so to do that, we have to be really strategically minded and change or tweak areas so that we can stay ahead of the game. So we got in a SWAT, uh, the equivalent of an Australian SWAT instructor. And uh, uh, four groups of nine, 36 men from the age of about 19 to I think the oldest would be probably 34, 35. Um, some of them play higher. Some of our boys played in a Super Rugby final against New South Wales last night in Narrabri. So, so our role is to get those guys, to, 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 to edify these guys and to help them to the next level. So they had a pack. They had to bring a pack and they had one litre of sand and one litre of water in their pack and they were never allowed to take the pack off. The water was their arms, was their rifle. So we sent them to bed around midnight after a, an activity. We'd allocated a whole lot of rooms and we said, you won't be going back to those rooms. 20, uh, 19 will go to this one room and 19 will go to another and you work out, there's six beds, you work out who sleeps in the beds, who sleeps on the floor and we will talk to you in the morning. So at three o'clock in the morning, um, the doors are bashed down. They've got to get up straight away and meet us down at the creek. So, so what they had to do was we had uh, a dozen barrels and we had four pallets and there were 16 pairs of blackout glasses. So the four leaders from each group had to put it on blackout glasses and their job was to take the four, pallet, the four barrels and the, and the one pallet and some rope and make a raft the followers with the blackout glasses. Their teammates had to instruct them, and it was pitch black, how to make the raft. So this went on for about an hour. Some of the rafts were fairly well made, some weren't. They then were instructed that they were going to get in the water, and the, the SWAT instructor said, just be mindful that it's now four in the morning, and this is a shark thoroughfare. <laughs> so this is a thoroughfare. So, so you can imagine the demeanour of some of the fellas. And, and one of the reasons why it was done is because some of them really struggle when it comes to water activities. So they, they got in the water and they had to walk their raft at waist height up to the bridge on the main highway where there were two ropes. And each group had to get their man up the rope over the, over the rail onto the highway, however they could see fit. One raft fell apart, so they had to go back to shore and put it back together again. So they're up waist height under the bridge, but the rope finished about uh, here. So what they had to do was they had to get their tallest man to stand on the pallet and then one of the shortest guys, the lightest guys, to stand on his shoulder. They then had to lift the pallet to get high enough to get a hold of the rope and then they had to wet with their pack and all their gear on, shimmy up this rope up to the, to the highway. It was bedlam. That was the start of, that was the start of um, 11 and a half hours of intense, uh, brutal mental and physical work for these guys. Now, our mantra believe it or not, is love. So we don't, and my mate, who's the other coach, who is a South African who loves the Lord, we don't preach hard to these boys, but they know who we are and they know where we stand, but we love them. And so this whole process was about head noise. So they would finish in the lake, uh, in the creek, and then they went to the beach. And they would do things like they had a 20-litre a can where they filled up with seawater, and for one hour on their stomachs they had to push one at a time from one part of the beach to the other. Into the water, back again, went for an hour. And every man, in the, one of nine, had to have a crack at this. And, and, and so you can imagine the fatigue that had set in come about seven o'clock yesterday morning. 
and the, the noise, and we, we talk about this head noise with these guys all the time. And this is, for me, the most wonderful analogy of our walk with God, of our calling with God. Because we say to these guys, you, you've got to get rid of this head noise. You're going to be at 80 minutes of a game. A game is 40 minutes each half. So last year in the semi-final, 80 minutes. Whoever would win the game would go to the grand final at Suncorp Stadium. 80 minutes, even score. Another 10 minutes each way. That's 100 minutes of rugby union at the top level, even score. We get to 105 minutes and one of our fellas came out of the line. I mean, he was, you, you, you can't imagine the fatigue that these boys are under and the injuries that they, a, a number of them carried at uh, the 105 minute mark. This guy came out of the line and took the man with the ball, spilt the ball, game over, Game was drawn, but because we finished at the top of the ladder, we go to the grand final, they finished. That 105 minutes of rugby was all about one whole year of preparation, of strategic preparation and the previous camp and then uh, them understanding how to play a sport that they choose to play because nobody's forced them to come and do this, how to play a game and get rid of that head noise. Their bodies screaming to them, physically screaming to them. And it was so easy for them to give up. But they were the last man standing. That has nothing to do with skill or IQ or being a prince of this world. That has all to do with an attitude of performance or an action of wanting to succeed. And that all came out of diligence because diligence as Solomon tells us is man's most precious possession so as I said we do this through love we have a young fella at the moment who's locked up he's made a really grave mistake in his life he's now waiting to be sentenced and he will be sentenced and so we as a group are there and we will continue to support this man and love this kid and love this kid who is so remorseful. And I'm absolutely convinced that what's going to come out of this is that he is going to see the face of Jesus Christ. Amen to that. Amen to that. So let's come back to the Word of God and the head noise. And God promising us in his word. So if, 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 if Jesus said in his word, John chapter 12, 14, I think it is, that greater works will you do than these, then you can be guaranteed that that is going to come to pass. You can be guaranteed someone in the world is going to put up their hand and say, I believe that, Lord. Holy Spirit, I rely on you. And greater works will will be done than the works that Jesus did. And there is testimony after testimony that we can find and read of men and women of God who have now done greater works than Jesus did, according to that passage of Scripture. So, point. The point is, again, we don't have to be scholars to believe. When I gave my heart to the Lord... Excuse me, the Lord had probably saved me from the pit of hell three times in my life at the age of 25 years of age. I wasn't a scholar. Somebody was willing to preach the word of God to me who wasn't even looking for God. The seed was sown and God did the rest. All I had to do and all you have, to, have had to do is believe has nothing else to do with anything else in our lives, whether we're, we think we're down here, we think we're up here. It's all about only belief. Let's now go to Romans 12.2, because I think this is extremely important and extremely important for us in these last days. I, I am not involved in any way, shape or form other than a group with our rugby boys in social media. 
obviously social media is a very, very big thing now, in the, particularly the, the younger generation. I'm not saying that that's bad or I'm not saying that's good. I just don't get involved. But what I do know is this. When I was a young man, we had no mobile phones. We just had the house telephone, which you could hear ring it from the backyard. But my parents would go away and they would go away to international rugby tours because my father was heavily involved with the Australian Rugby Union. But what happened was, we were young kids, they would go away, six weeks later they'd say hi, they'd say bye and hi. And we'd have someone look after us. So there was no noise in my or our lives from social media. And I believe that that can cause a whole lot of noise in our minds, in our heads, if we let it. But here's the instruction in Romans 12.2. And be not, conform, uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we are all born into the kingdom of God. We're born into a family that never dies. Let's think about that. We are born into a family that never dies. There's a natural death, but the most important death, that spiritual death, is now gone. That's been defeated by the Lord. So if we're going to renew our mind, one of those things that we constantly need to remind ourselves is, that we are born into a family that never dies. So what the Word of God is telling us, just like the boys with their one litre bottle of water, that was their armoury, our armoury is water as well. But it's that water that washes our mind. We wash our mind by the water of the Word of God. And that takes an action. That takes a decision. That takes a decision that we're going to say, there's a whole lot of teachers out there, there's a whole lot of books out there that I can read, that I can listen to. But I want to hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. I want to hear that still small voice. And the only way I can do that is to ensure and to choose and ensure that I'm continuing to wash my mind with the water of the Word. The Word of God, given to us by the power of the Holy Spirit so that Jesus is enthroned on our hearts. So that's the Word of God that then is sown into our hearts, conceived in our hearts. So we'll conceive it, we'll meditate on it or reflect on it, and then we speak it out with our mouth. And what do we speak with our mouth? It is written. To believe on him is to believe from the heart. So Dennis talks about Jesus being our friend. And the end of that passage of Scripture says that if we love him, we will keep his commandments. Let's go to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28, the start of it, talks about us hearkening to his voice and keeping his commandments. And if we do that, so this was to Abraham, if we do that, the blessings would come upon us as the blessings came upon Abraham. And it said, he will set us high above all nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. Why? Because we hearken to his voice. Deuteronomy 28, then 1 to 14, goes through all the blessings of Abraham. And then it goes on to the curses. And you read those blessings and then you read the curses. Those blessings and those are curses are all about the benefits or the promises that God has given us because of the new birth, because we are born again. See, see, 
we've started our life, our eternal life now. The eternal life doesn't start when we leave this earth. It's here and now. All of us will be together for eternity, for the rest of our lives. But the Lord's given us a blueprint to be able to get through this really tough time on earth. And it was never meant to be easy. It's not meant to be complicated, but it was never meant to be easy. And the reason is because we do have an adversary. There is a roaring lion that roams around looking to nail us at every occasion. So when you go back to that, that uh, passage of Scripture about the cult, Jesus' strategic plan was obvious. It was all about renewing, in the, uh, renewing the minds and the hearts of the disciples, just like he wants to renew our minds and our hearts on a daily basis. But the reality is the battle is a battle. And where does that battle take place? The battle takes place in the mind. It always has taken place in the mind and it always will take place in the mind. Just like we try and coach our boys. See, we co coaching is about moving somebody to action. They make the decisions in their life whether they want to go to the gym at 5 o'clock in the morning. They make the decisions in their life whether they want to get up and go for a run at 4 o'clock in the morning. They go to work and then they come to training. That's their call. But we're, what we're here to do, what our job to do is to move them to action and strategically move them to action so that as a team, they can unfold a plan on the paddock under absolute duress, under mental and physical duress. By choice then, it's all by choice for them, then to be successful. reason why I love the game so much and one of the reasons why I've kept on with the game since I gave my heart to the Lord. It is such a wonderful breeding ground for young men and young women on the realities and the experiences of life. Because this is exactly what Jesus was trying to do with his disciples. To believe on him is to believe from the heart, is to have a moment by moment consciousness of his presence. The kingdom of God is the word sown in our hearts to bring forth the fruits of righteousness. It's not complicated. So my message is, let nobody steal your crown. Jesus has been enthroned on your heart. Let no one steal your crown. So we need to be diligent. We need to be zealous. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit for the enlargement of the capacity for the risen Christ in our hearts. That's why we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit to overcome. We've already received the power. We don't ask for the power. The power's there. It's not God who changes it, that has to change. It's us who have to change. And when we read the Word of God, and we read the Word of God by the Holy Spirit, the Word of God tells us that it comes about by yielding and yielding and yielding and yielding and yielding. And the result is a broken heart and a contrite spirit. So Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, His Holy Spirit, is constantly leading us to action. And the battlefield is in the mind. And we're never to allow the suggestions of Satan to dethrone that higher principle or those higher principles in our mind. Because that's what Satan will do. Satan will endeavour to dethrone those higher principles that we know, those experiences of the power of God in our lives. So we saw the power of God working in the young girl here two weeks ago. So we've seen that now. Satan will endeavour to dethrone that from your mind. But we need to remain vigilant and we re need to remain zealous. 
See, the beautiful thing about this is this has nothing to do with religion. We are not religious people. We are people who believe, only believe. We believe, we be, I believed a message that was preached to me by a fellow believer. And I could choose to listen to the message or not. Praise God I listened to the message and I am forever thankful. But all we're to do is believe. And the truth is, if we give in, we're going to dethrone that higher principle. There is absolutely no doubt about it. What's the higher principle? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. That's the higher principle. I'll start to close. Matthew eleven twelve. And from day, the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven is a violent place. Why? Because the word of God has told us that. And so we see what we see. But as we get more mature in the things of God, we start to realize that there's an invisible world out there that is very much more real than this world. See, this world is going to be burnt. It's going to go. The only thing that's going to be left is the Word of God. Nothing but the Word of God. So it's that immutable Word of God. We believe an invisible God but we know by faith that we are born again. We know by faith that we've received the Holy Spirit. We know by faith that if we lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Why shall they recover? We never promised that. God promised that. But for that to happen, or for me to be the instrument, I've got to yield and yield and yield. So here's my closing. Strategically, there's a blueprint for us. And it's in the Gospels. And it's that passage or those, the passage of Scripture where Jesus was tempted by the devil for 40 days and for 40 nights. That to me is an absolute blueprint of our lives on this earth. And there were three outcomes of that three things that we take away that we action in our own lives so that we submit to God we resist the devil and he flees the first one we live on the word of God number two we don't listen to the tempter Jesus didn't listen to the tempter we don't listen to the head noise. And there's going to be more and more head noise as we go through the last days. You turn on the television, you're going to get head noise and head noise and head noise and more head noise. And number three, worship the Lord thy God and serve him. That's the blueprint for our lives as believers. The heart conceives, the mind reflects, and then the mouth speaks. And what does the mouth speak? It is written. Let's come back to Sarah. Sarah, for 25 years, so Sarah was, or well, Abraham was 75 when he received the promise of God that he would be the father of many nations. So we look at Ju uh, Abraham, the blessings and the curses of Abraham in the Old Testament, and then we fast forward to Galatians, around uh, Galatians chapter 3 it is, and in there it says that God preached the gospel to Abraham. And it's, then it says, in thee all the nations shall be blessed. 
Let nobody steal your crown and tell you that you can't be blessed on this earth. That's not the truth. But it's a fight and it's a battle and the war is waged in our minds. So Sarah and Abraham, their bodies are deteriorating. Sarah finally conceived in her heart that she was going to conceive seed and they had the child Isaac. But why did that happen? Because Sarah believed that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. There was no skill in that. There was no princeliness in that. There was no hierarchy in life. God promised that they would bear a child 25 years before it happened. So is that a pretty good blueprint for us to say we never give up? We stand and we stand and we stand because the devil will dethrone that higher principle if you let him. He has no other power over you. He will dethrone it if you let him. And Abraham and Sarah, they didn't let that happen. The head noise they would not accept. Amen? Okay. Uh, I think the praise and worship team are going to come up shortly. Um, thank you. We might just take communion now. I think it would be an apt time. And just reflecting upon that message and the truth that we heard in that message, we believe because... A written word was revealed to our hearts by a power that we can't see. Correct. That's faith. So, so that substance of faith, that's invisible. Don't even try and see it. You'll never see it. Faith is an invisible substance, but it exists. It's probably more real than what we are. So we stand here today, we come and gather today because somebody preached the written word that has been revealed to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that written word is all premised upon God sending His Son to forgive us of sin. He sent His Son to this earth by choice to save us all. So when we hear a message like that, that message must always be premised on love. See, when we hear the word commandments, the law's been fulfilled. There is no law. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law. It's a law of love. Nothing less, nothing more. So what we do now is we then do what we're instructed to do or we heed the Lord's voice. And what did He tell us to do? Remember. Remember what He did on the cross for us. Remember that death that was absolutely brutal. So we talk about young men going through intense um, physical and, and, and mental brutal training that was nothing our Lord died the most gruesome death on the cross for us so do you reckon the least we can do is take him at face value take his promises at face value the least we can do is say 
I, I'm just not going to accept that head noise anymore. Why? Because I know the head noise is a lie. It's not the truth. The majority of the stuff that goes through our heads is not the truth. So what we do now is we take the emblem, so we'll take the bread first. remember now you know what the Lord did for us on the cross and we remember his broken body because if that never happened we wouldn't be sitting here today and I guarantee if it never happened I wouldn't be here today guarantee so the least that we can do is remember the work the atonement the atoning work on the cross the redemptive work on the cross that means we've been redeemed from the curse of the law we are not under the law. The devil will continue to remind you that you are under a law. There is no law. Our only law is the law of love, to love one another. Loving God's the easy part, to love one another. Let's take the bread. Now we take the cup. Now we take the cup. We remember that the, the blood that he shed on the cross for us. And think about that. That is the most mammoth act that's ever happened on this earth. Why? For us, for me, who knew nothing about God, I didn't want to know anything about God. But he loves us that much. Let's take the cup. finish off on that again please um, if anybody would like prayer can you grab me after because the book of Acts hasn't stopped it, it ended abruptly in the word of God it goes then the word of God goes then into the epistles and if we're brutally honest with ourselves those epistles were written for those who had received the Holy Spirit but the book of Acts is still in action this morning all over the world people will be healed people will, will be saved people will be set free so if anybody needs any prayer just call on us call on myself or the elders of the church and let's go away this week be mindful we're just not going to accept the head noise or let's choose not to accept the head noise now let's get on our face before God and say, Lord, I can't take this anymore. Help me. And I guarantee you he will. Because we don't do this in our own strength. He wants us on our knees. He wants us to rely on him. He wants us to acknowledge his lordship. And that means that he's enthroned on our hearts. And that enthronement is a higher principle. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Amen.